Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Those species like black bream and bass appear to have been extending their distributional range northwards year on year from around the latter third of the 20th century through to present time, which is 2011, arguably as a result of rising sea temperatures, with catches of both species, and in particular bass now fairly common well up even into Scottish waters, for the bream at least, North Wales still remains the main northerly stronghold limit. Cardingham Bay, for example, has had them since my early days of sea fishing back in the 1970s, and very likely, even well before then. I'm not sure when the push around the Clint Peninsula into Carnarvon Bay began in earnest, but I do recall fishing for and catching them in the Menai Straits back in the mid-1980s. And speaking of the Straits, from a charter angling point of view, its sheltered waters still offer the best base for fishing Carnarvon Bay and beyond into the deep water of the St George's Channel where a littering of wrecked ships lost en route to Liverpool and Hollyhead at various stages throughout history remain one of the best sources of big pollock and coal fish in the area. A common sight over these wrecks off the Lynn Peninsula is Andy Owen, who skippers the 11 metre Port Dinorwick based catamaran Morgan James II, which I'm out fishing aboard today. That said, as an angler rather than a charter skipper, wreck fishing is not your main interest, though obviously, as with any other business, you have to go where the demand takes you. Given a free choice, I know you would much rather be taking out parties closer to shore in search of a two species mentioned at the start of this podcast, bass and black bream, with bream in particular our main target species for today. But before getting into the fishing, I'd like you to give us a little bit of the history about yourself, because you have quite an unusual and interesting CV. So tell us a bit about your life before charter fishing. I started my fishing career uh, in my early 20s where I was a commercial fisherman until the early 90s and I took some time off and went to work down Antarctica skipping various boats down there and taking divers out and then after a couple of years decided to come home and then set up myself a charter business fishing out of Carnarvon and mainly fishing Carnarvon Bay and the uh, wrecks out of St George's Channel. So by default you're now a wrecking skipper. That's how most anglers see you and that's what you've built a well respected reputation for doing. But I know that that really isn't where your heart is. Though obviously, as I said in my introduction, this is your living and as such you've got to go where the business takes you. That said, your own personal angling and skippering preferences lie very much closer to base. So tell us then what your ideal charter fishing day out from Port de Norwick would shape up like. Most people book me to go wrecking but we have we have you know a lot more fishing on offer especially inshore on the reefs down the Thane Peninsula which has excellent uh, bream and tope fishing along with lots of other species codling, wrasse, pollock, coley and also over the clean ground there's excellent ray fishing but um, I've, you know over the last few years people don't seem to want to do that anymore they seem to just to want to go wreck fishing and uh, fill their boots with big bags of fish you know pollock and cod but I'd just like to see uh, more anglers uh, coming back to going fishing for species etc in shore rather than going what I call meat mongering on the wrecks because you know as I said years ago when I first started everybody wants to go fishing in, uh, in Carnarvon Bay and used to have nice competitions on the boat catching lots of species but uh, it seems to have all died away that now which uh, I don't know because you know as we have excellent fishing in Carnarvon Bay in the season here I have fished these wrecks on a number of occasions, both from Patheli and from my own boat. And the first thing I became immediately aware of was the depth of water covering them. Even by English Channel standards, this is deep. The other interesting fact is that there seems to be a lot of them in close proximity. So before moving on to look at the reasons why we're out here today, which is to fish the reefs, can you fill us in on a little bit more of the details surrounding these wrecks, such as how they got to be where they are? Most of the wrecks out in St George's Channel here were sunk in 1917 by the U-boats. The good wrecks, which still hold good heads of pollock, are usually in about between 80 and 100 metres of water. And they, they start fishing in mid-May, right through till, Rob depends on what the winds are like, etc. And the water clarity, but until towards the end of October. But uh, in the last two years we've been uh, getting a good 
a good head of cod on them again, which is good to see. Not on every wreck, but uh, on a few, where we had a slack spell for about three or four years. Some of the really deep ones can be in as much as 400 feet of water, which in a good lick of tide can make them difficult to fish. What then are your recommended tides? To be honest, people have got this thing about neap to going on these wrecks on neap tides. We find the very small tides on them not as good. Uh, medium sized tides probably the best when there's a fair flow over them. But um, these, these neap tides, 23 foot, really are just, just anchoring tides. Right, that's enough about the wrecks. We're here for other reasons today, the primary objective being to get a good haul of black bream. And to do that, you need to be more tactically aware than with other small species of fish, because bream are notoriously quick feeders with comparatively small mouths. What would your recommendations be in terms of hand tackle, hook sizes, rigs and baits? For the bream and that, um, 15 pound class gear, 10 to 15 pound line, small multipliers, and just simple two hook rigs, or even just a set of shrimp rigs on the end. That seems to get the best out of the bream, but um, also good for catching lots of other small species, you know, wrasse, all the species of wrasse, small pollock, codling, coldfish, etc. That's the second time now you've mentioned the cod, which is something I was intending to explore in a little more detail later in the interview. But as we're already on the subject, we might as well carry on and develop that particular part of the story now. I've heard from a number of sources, yourself included, that cod population numbers this current year, after having not been too good of late, have apparently exploded, and not only out over the wrecks were the better fisher to be found, but inshore too, where undersized fish are feeding over the reefs in big numbers as well. The question this then raises is, could this be the start of better things to come in the same way that the North Sea has made a spectacular comeback recently? What are your thoughts on that possibility? We don't know, really. it's just all of a sudden there's been a big influx of cod into the Irish Sea, bigger cod on the wrecks and all the inshore reefs all carrying a good head of codling, the best we've seen for years. I know they did have a, th a thing on the um, on the cod fishing with the trawlers, they did have a cod ban for a time and that has helped, like it has off on the east coast, off Whitby, where there's a, a lot more cod around there again now which all stands in good stead, doesn't it, for the future. Now, back to the job at hand, the inshore reef fishing. Although this has been billed primarily as a black bream fishing trip, we both know it's going to be more than that. A lot of other species are also expected to put in ashore. Just exactly what these might turn out to be, to some extent, depends on the tackle and bait choices made by the anglers on board. So tell us a little about what species have been caught in the past and what we might reasonably expect to see here today. We get all sorts of species here. Um, we've had triggerfish, we've had John Dories, um, like this morning we've had a ling, wrasse, coley, pollock, dogs, taupe. Just a mixed bag really, isn't it? And let's not forget the other inshore fish which people in these parts are also very keen to catch, sometimes in huge numbers, that being the bass. Though we aren't realistically expecting to see bass here today, could you fill us in any way on a few of the details regarding that particular potential too? Bass fishing appears very good from probably early August back to the back end of November, where we fish some of the offshore banks. We still get large numbers of fish, but not as big as they used to be. And that is due to overfishing, I'm afraid. And when you say large numbers, by any definition of the word, it's large with a capital L. Yeah, yeah. We see we, we average between uh, 60 and 120 bass a trip in the autumn, uh, from two pound up to four pound. That's some bass fishing by any standards. So what are the tackling tactics most likely to regularly achieve those sorts of catch numbers? Very small boom or zip slider and about a 10 foot trace with a live sand deal on a 3 to 4 o hook or even a frozen sand deal whipped on with cotton bait elastic which works nearly as well. And then just simply drifting over the bank and uh, dragging the bait across it. Presumably, live sand eel will be the best option, which is not an easy bait to get hold of for many people, particularly parties travelling here from inland. 
unless of course you can provide them as part of your charter. Uh, I troll the sand deal on one of the insure banks. There is plenty of sand deal about. We have no problem getting those apart from later on in the year November when they just, then we use the frozen sand deal for the bass. That's a pity because I believe the biggest catches can be made in the late autumn on into the winter months. Tell us then a little bit more about the seasonality and just how late on into the year you can expect to see them. Second week in December, this seems to peter out. Sounds like the perfect location, not only for a charter boat, but for a small trail boat too, which on both counts I know it can be, but not all of the time. As with all venues, the weather can also have some say in things, but for some aspects of your fishing, it goes a little further than that, because off and around the Lynn Peninsula, there are some pretty dodgy places simply to have to travel through, never mind to fish, in the main due to the tide. They don't hand out names like Hell's Mouth and Devil's Ridge for nothing. And while these areas may well be less of a problem to a huge catamaran such as Morgan James, they are nonetheless places to be given a wide berth under certain conditions. Which is really a pity, as it's some of these marks, plus the ties that have sculpted them, that are so attractive to the fish. What then would your advice be to people who are hell bent on fishing these areas, particularly from a small boat? Well, I certainly would not go down fishing around the end of the Thane Peninsula, Bardsey Island, in winds over 10 mile an hour in a small boat. And even if you have a 10 mile an hour wind against the tide down there in, a, in your average, say, warrior type boat, conditions are going to get very, very uncomfortable. My advice to people would would be to concentrate fishing really in small boats to so stick in the Carnarvon Bay area really because um, as you say the further down you go down the peninsula the tides get very strong and any wind against it there and it, you know, it, it can get dangerous especially on the banks uh, by the side of the sound there Despite all the potential problems associated with rising sea temperatures and despite the fact that for some fish this could also be a disaster Species, which previously saw Britain as the northern extremity of the distribution, are now able to expand that range, and the black bream has certainly been one of them. Where once Carnarvon Bay was pretty much the upper limit of the range, they can now be caught in good numbers even as far north as Scotland's Loose Bay. What, if any effect then, has this had on population numbers here now, compared to how it used to be? We're definitely getting uh, better bream fishing up here now than we used to. But a lot of some species have actually moved away from our area, i.e. tub gurnards, smooth hounds. Tope fishing is as good as ever. Never, I've never seen a decline in the tope fishing. Um, yes, I, we're, we're going away from what you asked me there then now, aren't we? Let's then open the question up to taking any other observations you've also made, with particular emphasis on the rays. The rays over the like, well, up until about five or six years ago, the ray fishing got so bad we struggled to catch half a dozen rays in a day and now we can go out and catch 50 or 60 rays in a session quite easily so they, they've made a tremendous comeback uh, the thornback rays but as well as winners have there also been losers I'm afraid that the bass are the losers um, still good numbers of small fish around but uh, sadly uh, the big bass are, are lacking in numbers now as I said, they, they do not get a chance to grow anyway. They are caught, you know, once they get to about four pound in weight now, they seem to, uh, seem to get caught. And presumably then, not put back. Yeah, and uh, not put back. The uh, lots of your so-called dinghy anglers are all catching them and maybe not catching an awful lot, but if you add up the amount of dinghies catching bass and uh, knocking them on the head, selling them etc, um, it does, uh, does have an effect. How important to you then is conservation in modern day sea angling? What level of role does it have to play? What's the message coming out of all of this and how do you, or we, get that message across? Well, I, should, I do think there should be a uh, two to three fish limits on all uh, recreational anglers, dinghy anglers, uh, regarding bass. Black bream as well, I, should, I think six black bream is more than enough really for anybody to take home. We should have more limits on the fishing around here and what, what anglers do take, because, you know, 
we all think, yeah, this is, we're not catching enough, we're not doing any damage here. But if you add up all the anglers and take in so many fish, it all mounts up. I think what would help in that respect would be to have those limits written legally in tablets of stone. Any charter skipper seen to be limiting what anglers can take home runs the risk of throttling his own business. Though I have to say that Scottish charter skipper Ian Burrett seems not to have suffered any ill effects and he operates a 100% fish return policy, including national records. But, if it's the law, it's the same for everyone and not the skipper's decision to make. Potential animosity is therefore removed at a stroke. Exactly, yeah. But like, I think we should, it would be nice if we had bag limits when we went out wreck fishing, but sadly enough, the, the, the pollock we catch out there, I'm afraid, uh, have pretty much had it by the time they get to the surface. But if they had a bag limit out there, nobody book the boat anymore. <laughs> What I'd like to do at this point is to have you paint a broader picture of Carnarvon Bay. Starting at the exit point from the Straits and working down to the extreme limits of where you might fish, give us an overview of the type of ground and marks you have at your disposal, along with typical depths, species and seasonality. Coming out of the Menai Straits, the first part you hit is the Carnarvon Bar, which is uh, a two mile long bank stretching from Dinis Dintler towards Llandon Island. And then for the first few miles out, you've just got basically a sandy, muddy bottom. And then as you come down towards Nevin, the, r the ground starts getting rougher then. Lots of patches of rock, broken ground. And there's very much the same all the way down the same peninsula to Bardsey is uh, basically a mixture of rough ground, rock. How does this relate to fish species? All the rough, broken ground seems to hold uh, certain patches of best than others, obviously, but seems to hold taupe, good head of hus, dogfish, and localised patches hold the black bream. And again, on the clean ground, especially the muddy bottoms, is where the thornback race seem to be thicker on the ground. I believe that this area also has a reputation for producing a few turbot as well. There is. There is a few areas around the Carnarvon Bar and down towards Dinis Dintler where you can catch the odd turbots, but you'd have to put the hours in. And also a couple of banks down towards the end of the Thane Peninsula which hold turbots, but not as many, I'm afraid, as they used to be. And what's the fishing like actually inside the straits from a chartering perspective for those days when conditions are too bad to be straying outside? When, for example, you have a party that's keen to at least fish for something, anything, rather than completely cancel a trip. It can be good, providing you've got a, a good collection of baits, i.e. fresh peeler crab and ragworm. The best time in the Straits to fish is September, October and early November. September time we can get some reasonable catches of black bream and then the coddling start to show in October. But right through the winter there's, there's plenty of whiting, dabs and dogs and also quite a lot of bullhuss now starts to come into the Menai Straits which we never saw years ago. And the reason for this I, I, I don't know. So you can still get a reasonable day's fishing in if you want to, providing you adapt both mentally as well as tactically. Yeah, you, cer you certainly can, providing of course you've got decent bait. Do you yourself have any seasonality in what you do in say terms of either wanting to or maybe having to take the boat out of the water for maintenance and licence compliance work? Or do you try to fish all year round, conditions and bookings obviously permitting? I try to fish the boat throughout the year but uh, sadly um, people don't seem to want to go fishing in the winter round here. They don't seem to be interested anymore until May time where April's an excellent month for the rays in Carnarvon Bay and the best conger fishing on the wrecks off Anglesey is, believe it's not, in the winter. Sounds very interesting. So what are we talking about here potentially in terms of typical numbers and size? We've had congers up 60 odd pound and we've had a good day's catch would be 30 odd eels in a day plus, uh, plus spur dog and of course uh, bull huss. And presumably, some sizes of tides are going to be better for doing this than others. The small tides we fish, the, uh, the wrecks for the congas, uh, tides up to 25 foot. The best month, believe it or not, is January. Speaking of big fish and wrecks, 
I suspect that occasionally you're going to see and encounter some sharks out there. What experiences, if any, have you had on that score? As I say, since I've been fishing every year during probably the last week or two in August and the first week of September, we'll see poor beagles mainly taking anglers' fish off as, as they're coming up through the water. I have done a few trips for them, but sadly uh, we haven't landed any. But we, we did on one trip hook three within the space of half an hour and lost all three. And the, these fish were going up to about 300 pounds in weight. There was a time, probably in the 1970s to early 1980s, when Cardigan Bay, just to the other side of the Flint Peninsula, was rated as one of the premier rod and line poor beagle shark fisheries in the country. Yeah, well, as I say, the, the poor beagles do come in shore, especially around Barty Island area, June, July, and it seems to be that they head out to the deep water. I think the water gets too warm for them as the summer moves along, and they seem to move out to the deep water wrecks then where the, where, where the water is cooler. But I have no experience of fishing in shore for the poor beagles, but I do know there's a, there's a few people tote fishing over the years who've hooked them and uh, lost them. Looking back to when Cardigan Bay, as a poor beagle hotspot, was at its peak, like a number of other places around the country producing poor beagles at that time, as a species, this shark appeared suddenly to nosedive in numbers. Whether or not that had anything to do with rising sea temperatures, because poor beagles are a cold water shark species, or commercial fishing, it's hard to be clear about. What are your thoughts on that one? A bit of both really, because definitely the water temperature is warmer here now, and I am seeing less poor beagles each year. So the water temperature has got something to do with it. Also, the, the overfishing as well. The, there used to be a big fishery off, the, off Lundy Island and the Sillies there for the poor beagles. Um, I think now that that is finished, but so that did a lot of damage to the poor beagles so, ten years or so ago. Whereas today, for the most part, they're currently protected by law. Now you mentioned earlier, anglers hooking poor beagles while fishing for taupe. So obviously, taupe are an important recreational species in this area as well. To what extent then, could anglers fishing in these waters specialise in catching taupe? And what can be expected by anglers going down that route? As I say, the best taupe fishing we have up here is early May for the pack taupe, where anywhere between the Carnarvon Bar and Nevin, to a few miles out, you've got chance of hitting these taupe, but they do move around, and some days we can hit large numbers of, say, 30, 40 taupe, up to 30, 35 pound brackets. By early June they have moved off then and the taupe fishing become very hit and miss. And then as we get into mid-August the taupe seem to make a comeback then along the Thane Peninsula. But then there's a lot bigger taupe move in then, especially down towards, further down the peninsula towards Bardsey where we do a few trips each year and regularly catch taupe up to 80 pound in weight. On the subject of taupe fishing, interestingly, Earlier when we were chatting, you mentioned that you would also prefer to see anglers fishing the taupe with heavy commercial mono traces instead of wire. Not so much because mono is easier on your hands at the side of the boat, which undoubtedly it is. You have another very interesting reason for thinking this way, and one which I personally have never come across before. Well, I think uh, the wire in the water, in the salt water, emits some kind of electrolysis electrical currents and the taupe being very very sensitive can sense this uh, hence using mono leaders uh, we have a much better success rate preferably 200 pound mono for when we go for the larger taupe but for the pack taupe 150 pound mono is sufficient so reluctance to pick up base is not the visual thing as heavy mono is much thicker and therefore more prominent than wire doesn't make a difference the thickness of the mono really um, that is just the bait presentation. Now we've already talked a little bit about Andy Owen the boat skipper what would you like to tell us about the boat? Oh no, my latest boat which is four years old now I bought this brand new from South Boats on the Isle of Wight and it does make the ideal charter boat huge huge deck area it's fitted with two 300 horsepower Cummins engines which I can cruise nicely at about 16 17 knots with it and it enables me to fish up to force five winds 
which definitely makes a big difference this day and age now because the summers we're getting are a lot, a lot windier. At 11 metres in length, it's a big boat, but it's not a huge boat. Or at least, it doesn't sound huge until you step on board and see just how much deck space there can be on a twin hull track compared to a traditional mono hull. Having a 5 metre beam with a big, centrally placed wheelhouse offering all round access also helps. My Worry 175, for example, would almost fit inside the thing across the gunnels. Now that's some fishing area. Yeah, I had a, an island wheel I was fitted, so when we are drift fishing, I can get 10, 11 people down one side, so nobody has to fish under the boat. We have a 5 metre beam, so when we are bream fishing or tote fishing, we can fish at least 6 guys across the back. Which at anchor is reputedly the best spot which is definitely the best spot when you're fishing for bream and soap. And with that in mind, in fairness to everyone on board, you like to rotate people around the boat so that everybody gets a crack over the stern. We do, yes. We'll, uh, we'll change everybody around if they want to. And it gives everybody a fair chance then. So on a direct charter angling comparison, how then do cats compare to mono holes? Uh, much more stable at anchor, drift fishing, but they do not like punching out into uh, big head seas, so you do find we have to turn them off slightly. But all in all, far better boat than the mono hull. That's the only disadvantage with a cat, is punching into big head seas. Uh, they don't like it, but any other sorts of weather, running downwind, beam on, uh, we very rarely have to throttle down it, you know, we can maintain a speed of 60 to 70 knots, you know, I say into winds up to force 5, maybe more. In your considered opinion then, has the fishing in your area, for all the reasons you've touched on already, got better, gone worse, or has it just changed? Some fishing's got better. The tote fishing, uh, bream fishing's got better, the ray fishing's got better, bass fishing um, sadly has declined. Pollock fishing on the wrecks, still very good, but the uh, larger fish now don't seem to be there. Cod fishing has definitely improved the last two years, as so that's having been a big influx of cod again into the Irish Sea, which hopefully will uh, carry on for the next few years. And do you anticipate any further changes in the pipeline? I can see the the bass fishing going to get worse if the this illegal fishery carries on regarding the netting etc and dinghy anglers of course selling their fish. That said, how then do you rate what you currently have here from a regional perspective and by comparison to what may or may not be available elsewhere in the country? No, it's not as good as the English Channel is it? They seem to uh, have got better fish in those don't they Phil? I know a few people who might argue with that one. Some of what they have down south is better, some of it's also different, but I reckon that this corner of Wales could probably hold its own with most places most of the time. Do you think so? Yeah, I do. Well, as I say, our wreck fishing up here is as good as you can get in the English Channel. The inshore fishing, you can catch more species, maybe more species up here, but uh, green accessory maybe not quite as big. The tope fishing here is probably a lot better than the English Channel uh, and other parts of the country. And finally, how do you see the future for angling in this area, plus your own personal prospects? Uh, reasonably good, uh, despite going through this recession now. The only thing that frightens myself, uh, and, as, and as all of the skippers in, in this country, is the cost of fuel. So, fuel carries on going up. Wreck fishing will probably get too expensive for people to do. Uh, but, as I say, inshore fishing, um, with the right amount of people on the boat, can still be financially viable for people to do? Well, understandably, many people have limited amounts of disposable income available to them, which at the end of the day is what pays the charter skipper's wage. So when, or if, some things creep out of reach due to financial constraints, as much as we might like to think otherwise, the need to pay bills will always come first. Inevitably, it's going to be the pleasure end of the market that suffers. Yeah. So... So that's the way you see it going. Yeah, I think 
you'll find that, uh, as I said, the, the fuel carries on going up. Running these big boats like this, it'll get too expensive for people. We we won't, you know, we, we won't want to go out there and use tons of fuel and not make any money. But we can still do inshore trips, as we call them, providing you can get 10 to 12 people on the boats. We can still do fishing trips for, you know, around the 40, 40, 45 pound a head, which is pretty well affordable, isn't it, amongst most people? Well, it would certainly appear so off today's experience. It's midweek and still the boat's full. Well, yeah, this is, I'm surprised really, Phil. This trip I just put together for Tim because he wants to go bream fishing and I suddenly found I turned a few people away. Bring on more recession then, if that's the case. But like I was saying, you know, that's what he wants to mention as well. I don't know if it, you know, it's regarding the cost of hiring these cats. People think find them expensive to hire. But if they work out that they can actually put 12 people on the boat and then divide it by 12, you'll find that the, it is cheaper per head than fishing on smaller boats where you really don't want to put more than eight on the boats and have yourself a lot more space as well, but even with 12 people. But I do find that you know lots of groups have been taken out over the years are struggling now to get the numbers of people together. Until the financial climate changes, presumably it isn't going to get any easier. No. A big thank you then to Andy Owen for taking the time out to sit in the wheelhouse and be grilled, leaving the anglers outside to net and deal with their own fish for an hour or so. Had we been wrecking, that probably would not have been possible. But with smaller fish species, though they still need the landing net, it isn't so much of a problem. In terms of fish numbers, I would say we've possibly had around 30 bream so far, with ling, codling, ras and lots of small huss also picking up the baits too. There have also been a few bigger huss well into double figures, but for the moment, as predicted by Andy, the bream fishing has slowed as the tide hits peak flow, though they should be back later when it starts to ease, hence the timing of this interview. Next time out with Andy, I'm hoping to try some of that winter wreck fishing for conger. Something I'm particularly looking forward to.